So today we're going to talk about being in crisis. How do you know if you're in crisis, what to do in a crisis, and how to navigate and lead your team in a crisis? Uh, crisis is uh, something that happens to us in in our lives. There are big crises, uh, crises. There are small crises, and I, in my opinion, is that uh, people throughout their lives are going to go through you know, some major, major crisis level events throughout their lives. I think you're going to get, you know, two to three, like major earth shattering events that, that happen to you, whether it's on a personal level, whether it's on a, on a global level, but you're going to experience these things. And then you're also going to experience challenges and, and many crises um, on a monthly basis, annual basis, um, you know, it, it, it just seems like in the in the world that we live in today that there is a never ending supply of problems that are going to uh, beset you uh, from time to time. So let's talk about what a crisis level event is first off. OK, so the first thing that that I the first kind of criteria um, of, a, of a crisis level event in my mind is something that is um, typically. Uh, typically outside of your control you know it's it's, it's typically big in scope it's it, you know maybe sometimes it's it's self-induced especially on kind of a, a personal level but it's broadly something that comes outside of your control we can think back to the to the COVID-19 pandemic that was something that impacted everybody in the world and it was broadly out of um, out of our control so, uh, so, so those kind of things happen. There are health issues. There are, um, you know, d divorce can be something that that uh, hits you hard. Death of a loved one um, or a key partner. All kinds of things that can hit you hard. Um, and the economy slowing down now. Currently, as of this recording, our economy is actually in pretty good. It's in pretty good shape in spite of what uh, a lot of the, the news pundits might might tell you. But that doesn't mean that there isn't something lurking around the corner. And of course, in our own lives, especially in the lives of painters, um, we, we, have these, we have this seasonality. And because of the seasonality of our business, we can, we can know with a certain predictability that there's going to be times of plenty and there are going to be times where uh, we where where business slows down and if we aren't you know being the ant instead of the grasshopper then um, you know then every year running out of work can feel like you're in a, in a crisis uh, level event and so and so what do we do about that right um, how do we overcome this and this is going to be the topic of this uh, of this discussion how do we how do we solve problems how do we uh get get wrap our mind around what to do well let me tell you a, a story that happened in 1949 um it's called the the man gulch uh disaster um this this was a, a fire that took place in in montana it was a it was a, a large scale fire and there was a team of about 16 uh fire jumpers that had uh, gone to uh, contain the fire and, and uh, uh, you know, make sure everybody's safe in the area. And things quickly got out of hand. Um, you know, when they started, they thought that it was going to be what they called it a 10 o'clock fire, meaning that this is something that we'll be able to contain by 10, 10 a.m. and um, it won't be a problem. Well, the, the issue is that the, the fire quickly spread. Um, it, it spread faster than, than, uh, you know, the fastest man in the hundred, hundred meter dash. Okay. It, it spread fast and the team was caught on their heels and they, um, uh, most of them did not survive. Um, in fact, 13 of the men died and only three survived. The three that survived, two of them had, um, somewhat coincidentally found a little alcove to hide in. And the man who, who uh, and, and the one who didn't, um, he was the only one who was able to um, kind of think, think on his toes in the moment. And what he did is he, he climbed up the hill a little ways. He lit a small fire and created a, a barrier of ash. 
and then he laid in the ash and then as the fire came um, you know everything that was that he was laying in it had already been consumed so so there was nowhere for the fire to go and that's how he he saved himself however everybody else panicked and they didn't they didn't listen to this leader who who told them this kind of inco- unconventional thing hey we're going to light a fire and then we're going to lay on the ash they didn't believe him well there were a lot of things that broke down in the process of the of the man gulch fire things that we can look at are things like um lack of lack of leadership they were kind of a crew that was just somewhat assembled together they didn't have very much familiarity with each other um the the they didn't really build much trust with the leader dodge who who was you know one of the ones that survived they didn't trust the guy the 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 unconventional thinking didn't make sense to them it broke from the uh for from the forest service protocol and um and of course the panic kind of set in and so so this this uh this disaster um was was written uh written about by a researcher by the last name of wick and uh, he, he wrote a, uh, an article called The Collapse of Sensemaking, the Man Gulch Disaster. And so what we find in, in times where um, we, are, we are in crisis, whether it's personal crisis, business crisis, global crisis, what we find that when we're in crisis that people um, do one of two things. Either they panic and they're screwed or they make sense of it all and they figure out how to survive. So today we're going to talk about how to survive. First thing, it comes down to sense making. So sense making, what is sense making? Well, if we just flip these words around, it's it's literally just making sense of of what just happened. And 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 that is a skill that has to be developed and cultivated over time. In fact, it needs to be a skill that your whole team starts to cultivate and develop. Uh, we can look at this in terms of um, finding work or even doing the work. Let's let's tackle doing the work. Let's say you have a, a giant job that you have to do. Um, that job is uh, it's big, it's gnarly. There's a lot of components to it. There's a lot of complexity to it. The first thing that you have to do is you have to try to make sense of what uh the work is how much work is there how can we break this down into smaller components so that we can digest it process it and start to work through it uh when when a team doesn't engage in sense making of a of a project what happens is they just kind of jump in and they don't keep track of things very well they start to get disorganized and before you know it the project it, it becomes really expensive because there isn't this um, consensus on how to a- attack the job in a way that, that makes sense, in a way that's going to be efficient. You just jump in, you start frantically painting, and, and by the end of the job you realize, well, I didn't make any money on this, right? You could look at it in, in, in terms of getting work, right? Um, maybe you're doing a bid, and again, it's really huge, and you don't know where to begin. Well, you have to just sit down calm yourself and start to make sense of what's going on here okay bit by bit put it together and come up with a a a price that actually makes sense what if you are um, running out of work and you don't have work all right i think we've all been there before in that case again let's make sense of it instead of throwing darts at whatever marketing agency has thrown a Facebook ad and said, hey, painter, I can make you, you know, $300,000 a month or whatever it is. Instead of going here and here and here and here, let's take a breather. Let's figure out what has been working in the past. What can we, of those things that has worked in the past, what can we exploit and make even better? And what are the new things that we can try that won't be too risky. I think a lot of entrepreneurs are, um, they, they, they engage in risky business. And sometimes when you're not smart about it, when you're, when you're in that frantic headspace, you start to make a lot of decisions thinking that money's going to solve all of your problems 
when really it's it, it, what's really probably going to solve it is going to be your own effort, your intelligence and the way you go about things. I think a lot of times what happens when we're in this mode of, oh my gosh, the, you know, I don't know what to do. I'm running out of work or, oh my gosh, this project is huge. I don't know where to begin. We start going in what we call system one thinking. System one thinking is that flight or fight response, right? Or that freeze response. It's, it's, it, system one is controlled by your amygdala, the reptile brain. You've heard of, you've heard these things before, right? When you're, when you're in system one thinking, you're moving fast. You're trying all these different things. You're moving from one thing to one thing to the next, and you don't get very far in any direction. Okay. You end up in the same spot that you're in after spinning your wheels, wasting money, wasting time, and, and you've, you've gone nowhere fast. Whereas system two thinking, our more rational brain, the one that is is control controlling rational thought um, it's slower you breathe deeper you take a, 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 a drink of water and you slow yourself down okay this is where we want to be because when you're in system one thinking you're able to start making sense of the problem you're able to commit yourself to your values and your principles and you're able to move forward in a clear direction and path. This is where we want to be when we're in crisis. We want to move from system one thinking, frantic, all over the place, to calm, controlled, and methodical. So to do that, we have to, uh, you know, there are some very real human emotional things that we need to do, you know, breathe. Drink water, clear your mind, go on a walk, okay? Just slow down. That's the first thing. But then the second thing is we want to re- we want to look at the principles that hold true in our business, the principles that hold true according to the values that we hold. What has worked in the past? How can we keep doing more of that, Right? If we're going to try something new, is the experiment controlled and contained? Have we mitigated risk? Right. I I travel, you know, across the country and I and I teach things like marketing and, and project management. And I always try to get a poll from the audience. I get a sense of what what they're doing. And, you know, with marketing in particular, uh, one, one year I, or, uh, at one event, um, I, I pulled a Facebook, <clears throat> uh, group to see what was the most money that they had wasted on marketing. I heard of people spending $60,000 on a television commercial that got them nothing. I've heard $20,000 with marketing agencies, $6,000 with marketing agencies, $10,000, $40,000, and they get nothing. Okay. Now I'm not saying that all marketing agencies are bad. I wouldn't even say that they're bad people. I would never say that. I think that many of them have intentions of doing good. They enjoy marketing. They, they want to make money. They want to provide value. But there's a problem with the model of agencies today, okay? And then I don't, I don't necessarily fault them for this because they are in the business of making money and they have to make money. The challenge is that digital marketing in particular is quite unpredictable. And from market to market, there are changes and fluctuations that are, uh, th- that are outside of anybody's control. And a lot of these agencies, the reason that they do digital marketing is because it serves them best. Um, They can do digital marketing anywhere. The the thought process is, okay, if I focus on painting contractors, then I can learn from all these different markets and then I will be a better marketer and I will be able to go into any agent or any, uh, you know, market and produce and replicate results. 
uh, unfortunately, um, they, they're largely not able to duplicate and replicate results. Um, the ones that are really, really good are really, really expensive. And you should be a, a company with large amounts of, of revenue that can take the risk on uh, campaigns that fall flat. But if you're if your revenue is, you know, under or at around a million dollars, definitely under a million dollars, the risk of digital marketing um, is is quite high. I've talked to to um, paint. I talked to one paint contractor. They they uh, they reached the million dollar mark, and we started. Uh, and I said, well, <clears throat> how uh, where are you getting your leads? Like as a percentage, you know. We started talking through it. Uh, the vast majority of his leads came from repeat and referral clients. Um, he had a, a, a small amount coming from paid advertising. Actually, when we, um, you know, when we when we looked at what was actually coming from uh, paid marketing, uh, it represented about ten percent of their business. Okay, so if he's a million dollar company and it's ten uh, ten percent of business, then we're looking at about a hundred thousand dollars of revenue from. Uh, from marketing agencies and then I asked him I said okay well what was your how much what, what was your ad spend how much did you spend he said well we spent about twenty five thousand dollars so okay so if you spent twenty five thousand dollars to acquire a hundred thousand dollars worth of business that's about twenty five percent you had to pay your sales position you, know, you had to pay the sales you had to pay materials you had to pay overhead all these things. Did you make any money on those jobs whatsoever? He, he thought he looked at me and he said, you know what? I don't think that we did. Okay. So, so the, so, so I'm not, what I, what I'm not saying is don't invest in digital marketing. What I'm saying is know the risk, know, know what you have to lose and know how much you need to clear in order for it to make sense. I spoke to another, uh, another company about a $5 million company. I asked them, um, you know, where does, uh, I asked them questions about their closing ratio. Uh, he, he said, you know, as, as a typical, uh, you know, company that their closing ratio sat just below 50%. Okay. Pretty typical. However, when he separated repeat and referral from the acquisition of new company of new customers, he found that repeat and referral were coming in at a closing ratio of 70%, whereas new business was coming in at a closing ratio of 30%. Okay. What does that mean? Well, that means that the, the, all those repeat and referral customers, they came at zero acquisition costs that you don't have to really spend money to market to repeat uh, and referral customers outside of sending them emails, which basically cost nothing. Whereas your new, uh, new client acquisition typically comes from paid sources, Google ads, Facebook ads, Angie's, you know, lead generators, th those kind of things. So, so here's the thing. Think about this. If your closing ratio drops to 30% on the acquisition, of new customers, but your cost is you know, it's going from $0 to $100, 200 300 a lead. And, and I mean, let's, let's give you the benefit of the doubt here. Let's say it's $100 a lead. Well, if you're only closing one in three, then you are uh, spending $300 for every, uh, for every job that you win. And if, you're, if your average sale is between three and $4,000, well, again, you know, you have to look at the, the cost of acquisition. And, uh, and by the way, that would be really good. That would, that, that would actually be an okay, uh, you know, cost, uh, you know, of, of acquisition. But if you compare it to the repeat and referral, which has zero cost of acquisition, then you're going to see that, man, these jobs over here are way more profitable than the jobs where we have to, to pay to get the lead, right? And so if you're not exploiting your repeat and referral business, if you're not emailing those customers, uh, doing targeted neighborhood campaigns where you're 
putting up yard signs and flyer, passing out flyers and knocking on doors and saying, hey, we're over here at the Johnson's painting, right? If you're not asking for referrals, um, then, then why spend all of this money to acquire leads with an agency that's going to, you know, charge you a monthly fee on top of the ad spend when you could just send out an email and, and start getting, uh, getting more leads that way. Why, why go, why spend all of this money when, you know, when, when, uh, you could just pick up the phone and call a business and say, Hey, I noticed that your building has chipping and peeling paint and that the colors are faded. My name is Torlando. I'm a painter. Why, why wouldn't you do that? Why wouldn't you do that? You could do that from the job site, you know, pick up the phone. You could do it on a freaking ladder. And be safe, you know, don't do it on a ladder. But but my what my point is is that why why spend all this money on an agency that's gonna give you variable results when you aren't exploiting the things that are free, that just require a little bit of time and effort. So what we have to start doing here when we're in panic mode, when we are trying to figure out what the heck am I doing here. We have to move from a uh, frantic, try anything approach to a principled approach. What are the principles? And I and I say and I say principles rather than process. Let me take a minute to talk about the difference between a principle and a process. If you ask most business owners, I think in in especially in our industry. They're going to say that processes are everything. You have to have a process for everything, right? But what we can see in the Mangolch disaster is that process was a problem, okay? Those, those firefighters, all the ones that died, they were so fixated on what was the protocol, what was the process that was given by the uh, Forest Service. They were so, so kind of indoctrinated by process that they weren't able to improvise and they weren't able to figure things out when process fell, f fell apart, right? The process is broke. However, Dodge, the guy who, who survived, he knew a principle. He knew that in principle that a fire can't consume ash, can't consume everything, right? And so if the fire couldn't consume the ash, if he were able to create that contained brush fire, contain it, put it out, create ash for him to lie in, he knew that the flames wouldn't be able to touch him. That's, that's a principle. He understood the principle of, of how fires work, right? And so in your business, whether it's painting or finding new business, Figuring out what the principle is and training and teaching your people on the principle and giving yourself principles. It's going to help you reduce risk in your business. It's going to help you figure things out when there is, when things stop working, when things are going wrong. When you follow and commit to your principles, you're going to be able to succeed at a better rate. Okay. So when I think about principles, for example, when I think about principles of, uh, uh, of marketing, right? The, the principle of, uh, of branding, the principle of, uh, of action, you know, those are, those are things, the, the principle of providing value, those are things that guide me when I think about how to approach marketing. If, for example, somebody comes to me and they have, uh, you know, they have an offer to help me uh, win more business, they have, you know, some kind of trick or process or way of, of, of acquiring leads, I look at it and I think about two things. I think about, for one, you know, how much is this going to cost me? Am I gambling my money or am I... Uh, taking money that I have reserved 
for marketing to make a wise investment. Now, when we look at gambling versus investing, um, you know, it's a, it's a pretty thin line, right? I mean, at the end of the day, any investment is I put money in, I get more money out. It's supposed to, it's not supposed to be that different than a slot machine. I put money in and I hope that I get more money out, right? Gamble, but what's the difference between a gamble and an investment, right? A gamble is is one where you know when people when people are gambling they're often at the end of their rope right i mean like if, if if i used to live in las vegas i'm telling you okay people that the gambleholics it's a problem okay they they they're they're gambling their last bit of dollars in the hope that they can score their next win to pay off a bookie or you know to to pay rent and 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 what happens? The house always wins, right? So, so that's so. So you never want to be um, making money decisions when you're desperate, when you're in system one thinking. You never want to make financial decisions in system one thinking. We have to move to system two thinking. We have to know that our family is secure. We got food on the table. We've got Christmas presents and things like that taken care of. We're going to be okay. And we have extra money to invest. Now we can make, now we can make a rational decision, right? And so, so that's kind of the first principle. Am I making this decision out of desperation? Or am I making this, uh, this decision from a, from, a st- from a position of security? Second thing that I'm that I'm looking at is is this going to improve my brand? And you know, brand I think doesn't get enough credit. I think some people, especially your marketing agencies, uh, they they put more emphasis on just pure lead generation, and the, and they'll even say brand doesn't matter in painting. They're wrong. Brand matters in painting. Brand matters in painting. Okay. Your brand is your reputation. It's not just your logo. It's your reputation. It's what people say about you before you walk into the room. And brand is is the thing that helps people survive recessions. It's the thing that helps people uh, reduce their cost of lead. It's the thing that helps them uh, increase their closing ratio. How? Well, when you walk into a room and somebody knows your your company, they know your reputation, they know that you have a, a high standard of quality and customer service, they're just that more likely to go with you rather than having no awareness at all. Look back to, to my, my friend with the, uh, with the different closing ratios. 70% of repeat and referral were going with them. Why? Because they were aware of the brand. They, they believed in the brand, they had good experiences with the brand, and they want to use that brand. Whereas people who had not heard of the brand, who, who just, you know, are, are brand new, they're evaluating different companies, brand means less to them because they're not familiar with your brand, closing ratio drops to 30%. That translates to, for every 10 jobs, it translates to $14,000 in cost. So you have to, you do have to look at a company who's going to help you build brand, right? Build your personal brand and, and, uh, and, and, and build the company brand. The, the second thing, you know, the second principle that I'm looking at in, in my mind is, is the cost of acquisition tied to the revenue, tied to the, to, to the performance. If an agency has a set fixed monthly rate of $2,000, $3,000, whatever it is, and then you have to spend ad money on top of that, um, in principle, I'm not going to take that deal. Why am I not taking that deal? Because they will never be able to sustain that performance. They just won't because our business is, is seasonal. And so they'll have, they'll have seasons maybe where they do all right, but you're probably going to do all right anyway. And then the, the slow season comes and, and it's going to drop down and their performance is going to suffer. But what you pay them is going to stay the same. Okay. So, so you're paying, 
more money when they're giving you less value. How does that work? How does that figure? So out of principle, I'm not going to work with an agency that, that works like that. And unfortunately, that's most of the agencies, right? Because in principle, what we want to do with our finances is we want to tie as much of the uh, of our expenses to variable sales, right? That's that's wise business, especially in our business. If if I were a company that had consistent sales, reoccurring revenue or recurring revenue, meaning that I could count on the same number of sales coming from the same number of customers or or if it was some type of a subscription thing, then I'd be maybe more willing to work with an agency that that charges a flat monthly retainer. But because of our business structure, because our sales are dependent on demand, you have to find uh, uh, somebody who is going to just be willing to eat what they kill. And that's hard to find. That's really hard to find, which means that it's probably going to fall on your shoulders, right? And so, so keep those principles in mind. Be careful to, to notice when you are in a, in a place where uh, you're, you're desperate and you're moving in a hundred different directions and you're, you're, you're just going to be prone to make poor decisions in that moment. Okay. So, so if, with those principles in place, um, what, what that's going to do is unfortunately um, it's going to rule out a lot of uh, a lot of options that that look attractive, right? Um, but but in reality, they're just not going to be uh, good for you. So so what do we do? Well, this is where improvisation and a, and a word that that's somewhat new to me, so it might be new to you, uh, but it's the the word is bricolage, and bricolage is is a word. It essentially means making do with what's available. OK, teams that that employ bricolage tend to navigate themselves through crisis level events. OK, bricolage. What is bricolage? Well, bricolage is it's getting scrappy. It's guerrilla marketing, right? It's 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 taking the things that you have and and making do. Right. And and so, you know, one of the things that that I did with uh, with you know, with Crafts and Painter, as I said, okay, um, you know, let's say I have run out of business cards and I have, uh, I have run out of flyers and, and there's nothing that I can, like, I, I, I've, I have nothing. I just have me. What am I going to do? Right? Well, that's where, that's why I was like, you know what? I'm t I'm going to have my phone. So let me, let me make sure that I create my profile and I have a QR code that goes to my digital my digital business card, and and now and I can share this with anybody. And if I'm if I'm out of cards, I can pull out my phone, send them this link. Now they got my information, right? Uh, it's it's this idea of being scrappy, even in the face of having nothing. You know, could you go out and sell a job with no more than a blank sheet of paper? I've done it. I've closed jobs on the spot. Uh, you, you have to be crafty. You have to be inventive. Okay. And, and so, you know, with let's, let's take the marketing example again, right? The marketing example. I think it's a, it's a good example. Let's say that you needed to find jobs today and you did not have a huge marketing budget. You did not have uh, you know, a, a buttload of flyers. You did not have X, Y, and Z. Start with what you have. Okay. Start with what you have. Do you have business cards? If you have business cards, great. Start going door to door. Okay. Start knocking on doors. Um, you want to narrow it down so that you're not just, you know, pepper spraying everybody. Go on Zillow, look up houses, filter for houses that have been sold within the last 12 months. Go to those houses, knock on the door, have a conversation, okay? Uh, go, go on Google. Go on your Google Maps. Start searching for businesses. All of their phone numbers are available. Pick up the phone. Give them a call. Drop in. 
go to the business, right? Go to go to the business early business hours before things get busy. Go in, have a conversation with the owner. Okay. Use what's available to you. Okay. Get daring, get bold, get out there. Now, there are times, of course, where where bricolage isn't enough, right? You don't have a time, you don't have enough time, and you're, you know, it's it's like the it's like MacGruber, right? You know, the the idea is like, you know, bricolage is a very like MacGyver kind of idea, right? Uh, you know, if you're familiar with the, with MacGruber, he's he does kind of a MacGyver type thing, but he it, he never has enough time, right? Sometimes you're just hosed, okay? <laughs> like sometimes you you can't you know, there's not enough time, you can't do enough, and and you're just hosed. That that happens, okay? And so in those moments where where you where you've run out of time and you don't have um, enough, uh, enough gas in the tank and, and you're just, you're just going to hit rock bottom. Here's what I want you to know. Rock bottom is not so bad. I've been in rock bottom. Okay. At the time it sucks. At the time it's the worst, but it doesn't last as long as you think it will. And there is a path out. There's a path forward. There's a way through. Okay, I promise you that I've been there and there is a path forward and there's a path through. And on the other side of it, you're going to have those hard earned lessons, the things that are going to tell you, I can't do that again. I won't do that again. You're going to come through it with new principles. Okay, new principles that are going to guide your future and they're going to make your next effort one that's going to work. Okay. You can get through a crisis. You just have to slow it down. Move from system one thinking to system two thinking. Take a deep breath. Drink a glass of water. Okay. Have faith that it's all going to work out. And then commit to your principles and start getting crafty.